Welcome to Central Christian Church and welcome to our Sunday worship. Wherever you are, wherever you find yourself in this moment, I want to thank you for taking some time to worship God and to worship God with us. This is the last Sunday of January, and we are looking forward to coming back together as a church body, both online and in person, next Sunday, February 6th. Uh, the, the COVID rates have fallen tremendously in Fairfield County and in Danbury, and so we think if we take the right precautions, we can come together safely and worship together, both in person and online. So for those of you who are comfortable with coming um, to worship next week, I look forward to seeing you again. A lot has happened since we last were together on Christmas Eve, and so I look forward to, to seeing everyone and catching up with everyone again next Sunday. And of course, uh, for those of you who are not comfortable coming together, it's perfectly understandable, and we will still be worshiping online on our YouTube channel. So in whichever form you would like to worship with us, I invite you to join us next Sunday at 1030 here in the building or online. Uh, as many of you know, we do come together today with heavy hearts. The matriarch of this church, the woman who served this church for over 60 years, Ruth Lewis, did pass away on Friday morning in her sleep, very early Friday morning at Regional Hospice. Ruth was a humble servant of God and a humble servant of this Central Christian Church. As I said, for those of you who don't know who Ruth is, she was our church secretary for over 60 years, and her imprint is everywhere on this building. She, if you go to our office, you can find her signature still on papers. You can and find uh, um, instructions left by her. She, her imprint is felt in every corner of this building and in the hearts of many of our congregants and of the church body here itself. Ruth uh, has many stories about this building. I remember her telling me about how every week she had to do a church newsletter and that in those days they had to type uh, set the typing and so she talked about having to put the black apron on and get all ink all over her as she as she printed out the, the church newsletter. She just had served this church for so long, so humbly, and her wisdom about and knowledge of the church just was second to, to none. And so we give thanks to God for uh, the life of Ruth Lewis, for the service of Ruth Lewis, and we know this church wouldn't be the same, wouldn't be who we were without the, the work that Ruth Lewis did. She talked about how she saw so many pastors come and go, but she was the staple and the stalwart of this church. And so we give thanks to God for, for Ruth, and she will be having a graveside service sometime in the spring, according to her wishes, and when that time comes, we'll have more information. But um, we do come together uh, mourning the loss of Ruth Lewis, but as I tell everyone who experiences a loss, as advice was given to me, the relationships that we share with people aren't over when they pass. The relationships are just transformed into a new plane, a spiritual plane. So the memories that we have in our mind and in our hearts will be there keeping the spirit of Ruth alive in us. And we know that whoever we love, the love as Jesus showed us, love can't be broken by death, but just is transformed in a new way. So um, we do honor Ruth and give thanks to God for her life. With that being said, uh, it is Sunday and it is time to worship. We are going to be continuing our, our, our sermon series on Luke 4, and we will be talking about the reaction to Jesus' first sermon that we read last week. So let us come together as a church body. Let us come together as one body in Christ. Let us turn our hearts and our minds towards God and let us subtly and humbly turn our spirits now in a time of praise and worship. Oh, 
We come now to the time of prayers for the people. If you have any specific prayers that you'd like to have lifted up, I invite you to put those in the chat. If you would like me to pray for your prayer request, I invite you to call me, text me, message me. Um, just let me know in some way what your prayer request is, and I will lift those up in my own personal prayer time. I wanted to also give a note about next week. I know from talking to many of you, and I know from my own experience, that this has been a very tough season. We've been living through a lot. We've been living through um, a lot of sickness, illness, death. We've also been carrying a lot of weight socially with just the continual interruption of the virus and the changing of our lives and, and, and other things, not just illness related, but there's been a lot of burdens on a lot of us. And so next week when we come back together in person, um, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, a, a worship of lament. We're kind of like the blue service that's traditionally given around Christmas. Um, we're going to have a service where we acknowledge what we're carrying, the burdens, the laments, the, all the weight that we're carrying. We're going to have a service to acknowledge that, and we're going to give that to God. And so I invite those of you who are carrying a lot to join us next Sunday as we bring our burdens and our laments to God. So I wanted to give you that note as we prepare for the prayers of the people. Um, in the meantime, let's, I invite you to join me now for prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us this morning. Spirit of the living God, make your presence felt in us, O God. Spirit of the living God, allow us to know that you are here. Allow us to experience your indwelling within us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us today. Lord God, there's so much that we bring to you on this morning. We mourn the loss of Ruth Lewis while also giving thanks for her life. There's so much that can be said about this, your humble servant, but we know that she's in your loving care now. So Lord, we pray that our own grief, our own sense of loss will be met by your unending love. 
Lord, we pray that Ruth's life can be a guiding light for our own, the life of service, the life of humility, the life devoted to her church and the church's people. Lord, we give you thanks for the opportunity for us to know your servant and to experience the love that she had for so many of us. Lord God, many of us are struggling health-wise, we're struggling physically, we're struggling mentally, we're struggling spiritually, Lord. So we just pray that all of these experiences will be met by your Spirit and that, that's, that they can be held in a loving embrace in a way that only you can provide. Lord God, hear our struggles, hear our pain, hear our laments. And Lord God, transform them so that we can know that you are indeed God. You can show how awesome it is to be your children. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be together in a way that even as we gather in many different places, we come together through your body as one. Lord, I just pray that this body can continue to be together, and come, continue to come together, continue to be one body, even as there's so much disruption overtaking our lives. Holy Spirit, guide us, push us, but most importantly, love us in ways that we know you are present. Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, the living God, the one who is still with us and will always be with us, one who will never forsake us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us here and now on this morning. For it is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray all of this. Amen.
Well, today we are continuing our series that we started last week, our two-part series on Luke 4, Luke chapter 4. Last week we looked at Jesus' first sermon in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. We looked at how he pulled Isaiah 61 and said, Today, um, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, pronouncing himself as the Messiah, as the Christ. And today we get to see the reaction to his first sermon at his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. So I invite you to join me. We'll be reading from Luke 4, chap- uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 22 through 30. Luke 4, 22 through 30. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. In this moment, Lord, we come to you ready to hear your word, ready to hear your message. Lord, we pray that our hearts are ready, our minds are open, and our spirits are ready to experience what you have for us in this moment today. We thank you for this opportunity to be taught. We pray that this word will transform our lives to be living in more right relationship with each other and with you. We give thanks for this time and we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our collective hearts will be acceptable in your sight at all times. Amen. Well, Jesus had just rolled up the scroll, given it back to the attendant, sat down, and said that everything they had just heard out of the prophet Isaiah about the poor being given good news, about captives being set free, about the the year of the Lord's favor, about the blind being healed, all of these things they had just heard. Well, today, today, that scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus has just pronounced himself the Christ, the Messiah. And Jesus is at his hometown. Jesus had had traveled back to Nazareth and given this first sermon here in his hometown synagogue. And what happens? What about the people in this room? We get to be inside the room where it happened. And what happens is the people, after he sits down and proclaims himself the Messiah, Script Luke says that all, everyone, all who were gathered there spoke well of him. And not only spoke well of him, but they were amazed at the gracious words that he had just offered. The people were beaming with pride. Here's this hometown boy made good. Is this not Joseph's son, they say? Is, he, is this not the son of that carpenter? That, that many of us have seen grow up? Is that not this Jesus here preaching with authority and strength and proclaiming that, 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 that through him, the prophet Isaiah's words will be fulfilled, that God's mission will be, will be fulfilled? Jesus had preached a radical word, a radical sermon. And they were so happy. They were so beaming with pride because... He was their hometown boy, and they had a sense of privilege about their standing. If he was their hometown boy, he knew that everything that Jesus had just said would start off in their own city, in their own hometown. 
that they would get all the good parts of Jesus. Yes, the world would get some, but we would get the best because we're the privileged people of Jesus' hometown. Well, I don't know if Jesus had a sense of what they were thinking. Maybe he'd heard, as one commentator put it, they'd heard, Jesus had heard the people whispering and heard the gospel that people were whispering about him. And so he knew kind of where they were spiritually, and he knew kind of what they were expecting. And Jesus cuts off all of this talk at its root. Jesus, before they can say anything, before they can ask for anything, Jesus just says, you know what? I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, doctor, cure yourself. Physician, heal thyself. Meaning, he knows that they're expecting him to start his, his work. Start everything that he promised to do. He knows that they're expecting it, him to do that there in his hometown. And that they are the privileged few that will get the best of him. But see, Jesus cuts all of that thought off. He, will say, he says, I know that you're going to say, do here also in your hometowns the thing that we heard you did at Capernaum. Jesus knows that they're expecting him to heal, to cure demons, to, to, to teach there in Nazareth, to give him their best. And Jesus continues, and Jesus says, but you know what? No prophet is ever accepted in the prophet's hometown. And then he gives a couple of examples to make the matters worse. He brings out the prophet Elijah, and he reminds them in the scriptures when, when uh, Israel had been struck with a famine, when, when God had, had shut up the heavens and, and no food uh, was distributed in the land. There was a severe famine that they were experiencing over all the land. Jesus points out that Elijah was sent to none of the people of Israel, only to the widow at Zarephath and Sidon. Meaning, God dealt with an outsider before dealing with God's own chosen people. And then he points out Elisha, and he says, in, in, in the time of Elisha, there were many lepers in Israel. But God sent Elisha to none of them except to Naaman the Syrian, another outsider, another Gentile. And God allowed Elisha to heal Naaman before any of the lepers in Israel were healed. Well, what was Jesus saying here? Jesus was saying that God's love is extravagant. That God's love is for all people. That God's love is for, for people, whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether no matter who you are, God's love is for all. See, what Jesus realizes is that the people of Nazareth really expected Jesus to do for them exactly what he pronounces that he's fighting against. Throughout the Gospel of Luke, we hear about Jesus being the one to lift up the lowly and to bring down those who are living on top. That, that Jesus is, is, is going to bring a leveling of the playing field. That in God, all people are the same. And nobody deserves to be higher. Nobody deserves to be lower. Nobody deserves to hoard the, the, the riches. No one deserves to, to hoard the wealth. No one deserves to have all the good things. And no one deserves to not have what they need to live. No one deserves to live a, a life uh, where they can't get the food, the, the, the home, whatever it is. They, they, they can't get that. Jesus is here to bring a leveling of the playing field. And not only a leveling, leveling of the playing field, but God is going to pour out God's love on all people equally. See, the people of Nazareth were expecting, since they were from his hometown, they were expecting the privilege of all the gifts that Jesus had to come to them first and for them to get the special treatment. And that was exactly what Jesus was fighting against. Nobody should hoard 
God's love, or even God's gifts here on earth. Nobody should have all of this while other people have none of that. Everybody is equal. And it got, to me, it got me to thinking about different parts of the Bible where this is made true. We see right off the bat in Exodus, in the story of the people in the wilderness, God tells the people and when he provides manna from heaven not to take more than they need for that day. And if they do take more than they need for that day, that it would rot and go bad, and it would be pointless to gather more than you need. Because by gathering just what you need, it allowed everybody to have equal amounts. It also reminded me of the parable of the workers in the vineyard, which comes out of the Gospel of Matthew. If you remember the, that, that parable, it's the one that Jesus tells about how there is a, a, a man who runs the vineyard, and he has some workers that come with him in the morning, and they work all day. And then he goes out at, at, at noontime, and then at 3 o'clock, and he brings more workers in. And then he goes out at the 11th hour in the evening with just a short period of work left, and he brings in more workers. And then once the day is over, they come to get paid, and they all get paid the same amount. See, as one commentator put it, we have to imagine that we are all the 11th hour workers. A parable has many different ways you can understand it, and there's many meanings of a parable. Um, but as in this, this context, if we think about the, the evening workers, the ones that got just as much pay as the ones that showed up there early in that morning, if we think of all of us as the 11th hour workers, we realize how privileged all of us are because God's going to love us and pour out on us in equal amounts. God's gift is given equally to us all, and God's gift provides us with all that we need. But many of us, it's human nature. We want to have the best. We want to have the most. We want to have everything um, in, in storage because we want to experience that for as long as we can. We want to live a privileged life, even if it comes at the expense of others. But that's not what Jesus has come to do. And when we were threatened, when, when we realized that we are not the privileged, but in fact God privileges everybody equally the same, it can cause a triggering response in many of us. Just look at what happened in this story. The people of Nazareth realized that Jesus is not here just solely for them, but is here for the whole world, that they're not the privileged people because of where he comes from, that they're just, they're, they're just a part of God's people. They are filled with rage. And what do they do? It's, it's, a, it's a kind of eye-opening to see. They, they, it, Luke says they, they, they got up, they drove Jesus out of the town and led him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so they might hurl him off a cliff. They set out to kill Jesus right at the very beginning of his ministry because they realized they were not going to get the gifts that many other people got to experience. They were not going to be the privileged few. They were not going to be the chosen of the chosen. But in fact, they were going to be part of all of God's creation, where all of God's creation is equal and all are important, and not just a certain group of people, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles also, not just, um, not just a specific type of person, but all people are going to be, have God's love poured out on them. And we see it throughout the Gospel of Luke, throughout all the Gospels. We see Jesus healing. We see Jesus curing. We see Jesus teaching everybody who will come and open their hearts to him. So it leads me to this question. Are we one of these Nazarenes? where we want to feel like we're the privileged people who worship God, who worship Christ, and that we expect God's favor to be poured out on us, and we're going to keep it to ourselves. We're not going, we're going to keep it to ourselves, and, 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 and whoever gets it else receives it is okay, but we're going to keep it to ourselves, and we're going to, we expect it, and we know it's coming, and we want it to be ours, and, 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 and if you don't fit in with us, if you're not part of us, then you're going to be left out a little bit. I wonder how many of us would fit into that, that category, I would bet you every single one of us would fall into that some way because we're human, and that's something that we have to fight against. You know, I think it's human nature to, to, to have the fist, to grasp, to hold on to, to bring in, to hoard. I think that's human nature. 
And part of our faith journey, part of something Jesus has come to teach us is to let go, to open our arms wide, to pour out. See, if we go back to the beginning of the story that, of the Bible, we see God's continuous, extravagant pouring out of love onto us. From the very beginning, God pours God's self out into creation. And all of this world is made out of God's love. And we see God continually coming back to the people and, 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 and not able to, to let go of us as people who, who reject God and, and turn our backs on God. God is still there, always there, waiting for us to return. Because God loves us and pours himself out for us. And it's a model for how we are to live. It's a model for us to let go, to open up, to pour ourselves out on this world. But it takes practice. It takes the knowledge and, in fact, bravery and courage not to want to store things up, but instead to give things away. Many of us live in a state of fear, worried about whether we're going to have enough food, enough money, enough savings. Are we going to be able to provide for ourselves 20, 30, 40 years on down from here? Are we going to be able to provide for ourselves tomorrow? It's natural. But one thing we learn is that God is going to provide some way for us. And we're not called to hoard our riches, but instead to pour them out. And that's hard to hear. It's rage-inducing, as the Nazarenes show us. But if we follow Christ's example, as we go from this point on, up until and through the resurrection, we see Jesus continually showing us how to do it, most extremely on the cross. Jesus poured himself out through the cross, Jesus could have hoarded what he had and, and, and gone away, but he allowed himself to be taken by the authorities. And the authorities wanted him because of the love that he's pouring out on the people. He was causing the authorities problems, and so they wanted to get rid of him. That's how dangerous God's extravagant love is. When we pour ourselves out, it's threatening to many people. But God continues to call us to do that. Jesus continues to show us how to do that. God can, Jesus continues to let us know that our job here on earth is not to hoard, not to hold on to, not to grasp tightly to, but instead to release, to pour out on, to give, to love. And when we do that, we'll find ourselves living in right relationship with each other, with ourselves, with our God, with creation, all parts of us will be living in right relationship because we're living in the way that God called us to live. So where do you find yourself in this moment? What are you holding tight onto? What are you hoarding? What are you worried to release? Think about it in every aspect of your life. Think about it in every aspect of the world around us. Do you have something that is extremely threatening to you? I invite you to take some time to examine it, to look at it, and to see if that's something, a belief, something monetarily, whatever it is, see, examine if that's something that you need to let go of. Because once you let go of it, as frightening as it is to let go, once you do let go, you're going to be filled with the Spirit of God in a way that you might not ever have realized you could be. Because in that moment, you are living in union with God. You are living in union with Christ. Are you a Nazarene? Or are you a follower of Christ, ready to pour yourself out onto the world? The people of Nazareth couldn't take that they weren't the privileged ones who were going to get all of the spoils of being the hometown of Jesus. But Jesus said, I am here for all. My love is for all. And we have to continue to live in that way. Amen. trials and temptations. Everybody knows
those heartbreak isolation We come now to this table, this table of communion, this table that allows us an opportunity to be with, at one with each other and at one with Christ. It's a perfect example of how God's love is poured out for us all. It's through this bread that we are reminded that we are all one body through Christ. No matter where we are, no matter who we are, no matter what ways the world tries to divide us based on race, class, gender, sexuality, no matter what ways the world tries to divide us, that we are in fact one in Christ. We are all bound together as one. And it's this cup, which is the symbol of God's covenant, of Christ's new covenant, a covenant that is open to all, not just one particular people, but to everybody. We are reminded, as Paul reminds us, that there is no Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave nor free. We are all one through Christ and through God's new covenant. And so you're invited to come to this meal. No matter what you believe, no matter who you are, there is no barrier to this table. That Christ's message is open to all, therefore so is Christ's table. So if you feel the Spirit leading you to partake in this communion meal, know that you are invited and welcome here. Join me in a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to sit with you once again, to soak in your words, to hear your message, and to be pushed by you to live your mission in the world around us. Lord, you pour out your love on us. And thank you for giving us a chance to remember that we are called to pour that love out into the world around us as well. We praise you, we love you. Amen. It was on the night of his betrayal and arrest that Jesus gathered with his disciples for a final meal. It was at this meal where Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks for it, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take, eat. 
do so in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. For every time you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I invite you to take the bread and the cup now. Let us close this time of communion with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, once again, thank you for taking some time to worship with us today. I look forward to being with many of you next Sunday and joining the rest of you online. In the meantime, be thinking about the laments, the burdens, the hard hardships that you would like to bring to God, and we'll be bringing them together next week. In the meantime, Central, pour out that love on all who surround you. That's God's call for us. That's Jesus' example that he set for us. Live out the gospel by letting the love go. Pour out on each other. In the meantime, go now in the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ.